You need to turn around. Don't get that man in your So there's some things that need God to turn around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Things are not going as well as scheduled All right. or as well as planned. But the God that I serve is able to turn some things around. Open your Bibles with me, if you will, to the book of Exodus, chapter 27. As we move forward in our teaching on our holy approach to our holy God. And this morning we're going to be dealing with the brazen altar. Again, Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. The scripture passages read as follows. And thou shalt make an altar of a casing of wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his hands to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass, and thou shalt make it for the great of network of brass. And upon the net shalt thou make five, four brazen rings in the corners thereof. And thou shalt put in under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollowed boards shalt thou make it, as it was shown to thee in the mount, so shalt thou make it. On last Sunday we talked about the gate. And we said the gate represented Jesus Christ, letting us know that if we're going to approach God, we must begin with Jesus. Because he said, no one cometh unto the Father but by me. So this morning we want to move beyond the gate. And we find ourselves in a place called the court or what is later referred to as the outer court or the court of the Gentiles. Yes. It is so named this because anybody of the tribes of the 12 could come there. There was no barrier, there was no hindrances. For the gate said, to whosoever will, let him come. But when you came inside the gate, the first piece of furniture that confronted you was that which we call, that which scripture calls, the brazen altar. Amen. Now let me begin by saying there is nothing appeasing about the brazen altar. There is nothing about it that when you look at it, you are in awe. Because the brazen altar speaks of the awesomeness or the awfulness yeah. of sin. Remember, the purpose of the tabernacle was to teach us how to approach yeah. Yeah. a holy and righteous God. So when you come through the gate and the first furniture you see, that being the brazen altar, it reminded you that you could go no further until a price had been paid. Yeah. This morning we want to talk about again the brazen altar, which is the place of sacrifice and the place 
of atonement. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for this privilege of once again standing before these your people and sharing with them your word. We ask your God this morning to open their eyes and they be able to see with your vision, O oh God, this word. Make it come alive in their hearts as never before, Lord God. Yes, Lord. That when they leave this place, they just don't be smart. They don't just be enlightened, but they be empowered with a desire, with a zeal to approach you in the way that you desire to be approached. Let them leave this place this morning with a new respect for your holiness and your righteousness. Show them, brother, you are nobody to be toyed with or played with. And that you mean what you say and you say exactly what you mean. We come this morning, oh God, to give you your praise and to give you your worship. And I ask you, oh God, as you lead us to the tabernacle, God, that you will be our tour guide. That you will walk us through as our instructor. Be our schoolmaster, oh God, showing us and enlightening us as to what everything means. That when we finally get to that place where we can come into your presence, we have done so in the way that you have prescribed. And those who love God say amen. 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 I want you to turn to your neighbor this morning and ask him this question. And I shall use this question as my subject this morning. Say, neighbor. Neighbor, is your all? Is your all on the altar? The brazen altar represents the first step in God's plan of salvation. It all began with Jesus and His shed blood on Calvary. For you see, without the brazen altar, not even one priest could enter in. Not even one priest could have his sins forgiven. Not even one priest could at least be told for. Not even one priest could make it to the promised land. So the brazen altar was just not for a select few. It was for everybody. And that serves to let us know this morning that whether you preacher or member you got to approach God the same. In fact, I will go one step further. Based on scripture, is because you are positioned, because you are privileged with a certain position, God expects more out of you. Now, God, God may tolerate some things that somebody who is unlearned in the scripture may fall into. But if you are a leader, and God has spoken to you. God has a zero tolerance for disobedience. Let me say that again. Unlike man, God has a zero tolerance for disobedience. For the scripture is quite clear. The soul that sin, it shall die. And the tabernacle shows us how much God loved us. Because in using the tabernacle, God was able to keep his word and at the same time spare mankind. So the first step in approaching God is dealing with that which first separates us from God. And that is the issue of sin. For it is at the brazen altar that sin was atoned for. At the brazen altar, a symbolic transfer, if you will, took place. At the brazen altar, the priest would lay his hand on the head of the animal that he brought, and then the animal had to be sacrificed, and when that animal was sacrificed, God didn't see the animal, God saw the priest. So when the priest had sinned, before the priests are going for God on behalf of the people, the priest had to first make sure that he was in a position to approach God. 
The priest didn't get a get out of jail free card because he had a, a title of a priest. God required the same from the priest that he required from the people. If you look back in scripture, you see that when all altars were first instituted, and there are 433 different references to altars in the Bible. And not one single one of them is made of wood, except one. And that is the cross of Calvary. So the brazen altar represents, is symbolic of, is a type of the cross of Calvary. Amen. We see that initially altars were made for individuals. Then they were made for families. But we see this morning now they are made for the nation. So God is in fact expanding his love for mankind. Again, he started with an individual. You, you, you read in scripture how that when God did certain things, they erected altars as a memory of what God had done for them. The same thing about families. But now, here is an altar set up for the entire nation of Israel. And God had a requirement. Out of all of these people, God said, I only want one altar. I don't want an altar over here in the altar cross town. I want one altar that when the people come before me, they know they're not getting a substitute somewhere else. That when they come before me, it's me they want and not somebody simply standing in my place. In fact, we find a scripture that in Dan, they got tired of coming down to where the real temple was and decided they would build a temple that was closer to them, and God did not like it. God says, no, 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 I got one place where I want to be worshipped, and you got to go to that place. Only one altar. Only one place of sacrifice. A sacrifice made anywhere else would not be accepted. God was saying, at the tabernacle, this is the only place where I will meet with the sinner and deal with them based on their sin. So it is at the brazen altar where the sin question is dealt with. It is at the brazen altar where the need for atonement and reconciliation is made. When you come to the gate and see this humongous piece of furniture, the largest in the tabernacle, it reminds you of just how bad sin is. For nobody prayed, nobody was joyous, Nobody had a good time at the breaking off, but it was a place of judgment. And it was a place of death. It was a place where a sinless, blameless animal had to die for a deliberate sin that you and I had made. But even in that, God was showing us how much he loved us. He said the soul that sinned, it got to die. Something got to die. But because I loved it, and because I know that you are born in sin and you are shaped in iniquity, if I stood on what I just said, Amen. every single one of you would die. Amen. So what I'll do is I'll give you a chance to have your sin atoned for. Yeah. You understand? Atonement does not mean forgiving. Atonement simply means cover over. So that when I saw you, I don't see your sin. I see the blood of the animal that died in your place. Now understand, the brazen altar, as awesome as it was, had no power at all to change the individual. For a person could come to the brazen altar, bring their sacrifice, have it received by a priest, examine that priest, and receive by God, and go home, and on the way home, sin again. Because the brazen altar had no power to change the individual. But Jesus. That's why we had the cross. Because the cross, at the cross, our sins were not just atoned for, but they were also forgiven. I'm glad for the cross this morning. But it had not been for the cross. Every time God sees me, he sees my sin. 
He see my debauchery. He see my nastiness. But because of the blood of a spotless lamb, he no longer sees me that way. When God used the pattern of the tabernacle, he used the altar as a means of approach. Look at it this way. How many prepared to come to church this morning by a show of hands? How many actually made preparations to come to church this morning? Now, if I were to ask you what you did, you would say, well, I, I, I got my clothes together. <laughs> I ironed what needed to be ironed. I washed yesterday what needed to be washed. I, I, I did various things. But you know something in God's view, that don't mean a thing. Because you can come to church dressed to the night and be as sinful and as wretched as you want to be. Amen. And that's what the brazen off the dealt with. It's not about how you look. Amen. It's about who you are. Yeah. It's not about what you wear. It's about who you are. It's not about what you put on to come. It's about who you are on the inside. And God is saying, if you want to come to me, it's not about fashion. If you want to come to me, you have to prepare to meet me. You don't just walk in my presence because you've been to church. And a lot of us, we really haven't been to church in a long time. Oh, we might have been to a building somewhere. But we have not been to church. How many of you have ever gone to, to a, a movie theater and you stood in line and you pay some money for your ticket. And then you decide the last minute, well, I really don't want to see this movie. I'm going to go back home. How many of you have actually been to the movie? Well, you've been in the building. But the purpose of you coming to the movie theater was to sit down and enjoy the movie. So buying a ticket don't mean you've been to the movie. It is not until you have watched the movie yeah, yeah. that you've been to the movie. See, a lot of folks come to church, but they don't really come to church. They, they come no further than the parking lot. They, don't, they come no further than the seat they sit in. Understand, church, the purpose of coming to church is to hear from God. Yeah. If all you have done is come to church, sat down, paid your money, and, and heard somebody who was not of God, you haven't been to church. You ought to be able to say when you leave, did not our heart burn within while that man of God spoke to us by the wayside until your heart has been pricked. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So God is saying, if you want to come before me, you got to prepare yourself. Take your prepare yourself. It's not about how you look. It's not about who you are. But it's a heart preparation. The same way the priests had to prepare themselves first and then teach the people to prepare themselves, you and I got to do the same thing as Dick said this morning. The actuality of the old depicts the spirituality of the new. Meaning, what they did actually or physically, God requires us to do today spiritually. Have you prepared? They have you prepared this morning. Amen. When he told them to take the brazen altar off, there were several things that I noticed about it in my reading. Number one, I saw that it was to have no markings or no engraving on. Meaning there has to be no distractions. When you come to the brazen altar, it is a place of judgment. It is a place that you're coming to have your sins atoned for so that you could eventually be reconciled with God. But now, we can't do that in church because of distractions. I remember times growing up in church that when the preacher was standing and reading scripture, everything was stopped. Amen. Because we so reverence the word of God. But now, this morning, the scripture is being read. We got kids running around, kids screaming, adults walking around, the usher's trying to get you to stop, and you're just disregarding what the usher's saying. It's because you have no, you have no respect for God anymore. Same God. Amen. And God has said, I'm tired of it. I want to be approached this way. 
and this way alone. Pastor, you old fashioned. Thank God for being old fashioned. Amen. Thank God. Because old fashioned, they had a respect for God. Amen. They didn't have all the things that we have today, but we had a respect for God. Amen. We, we didn't have this and we didn't have that, but we had a respect for God. Amen. And we have lost our respect for God. And God says, if you're going to approach me, come to the brazen altar first. Because your sin will keep you out of my presence. Your sin will keep you from hearing me. Your sin will not allow you to hear what I want to say. Because your sin can serve as a distraction. The priest had to wear long garments covering their ankles. Because the scripture says no flesh could be shown in his service. Now I'm glad we, we, we have lost that. Because now what was passing for praise and worship service is nothing more than flesh on parade. Amen, amen, amen. But in the Old Testament, God said, when you come before me, I don't want no flesh to be seen. Because what you're doing, even though it's being done through a fleshly person, it's not being done in the flesh. What happened to the days of old? I mean, we reverence his presence. We have lost that. Thank you for the time when we came into the house of God. We, 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 we sat quiet. Waiting on God to move. But now we come in like we come into any other event. We come in popping our gum, chewing gum. Swagging in 30 minutes late. What happened to our respect for God? And then the people that, 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 that swagging in an hour late are the same folk that will get up an hour in advance to get to work on time. Amen. If you can give man that much respect and that much honor, why not God? Who woke you up? Who gave you that job? Who empowered you to go to work? But we no longer have the respect. God says that there was to be no flesh exposed at his altar. Because at the heathen altars, and all they did was exposed flesh. They even had sex at the heathen altar. God says, not over here. God says, I know that the, down, down in the grove, down in the valley, at the altars of Kamash and Moab, that they're having sex around the altar. But don't bring what's happening down the street into my presence. Because I will not accept it. Amen. Well, Pastor, they doing that. Well, let them do it down there. But as for this house, and as long as I'm sitting in that chair over there, we're going to do our best to do it God's way and not do it at all. Scripture says that there were no steps made for the breaking off. Because the step, you had to expose part of your flesh. And God says there were to be no flesh. So they built a ramp that the priests would walk up very slowly, making sure that no flesh would be exhibited or exposed while they were in service to God. At the breaking off, the Bible tells us that for seven days before they implemented it, for seven days, the priests had to consecrate themselves. And they consecrated the altar. Now, when I was reading this, the scripture took me back to Genesis, and I, and I saw something that I had never seen before. And that was the fact that God himself initiated the first sacrifice, and God himself initiated the last sacrifice. Pastor, what do you mean? In the, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says their eyes came open and they knew they were naked. What did Adam and Eve do? They made fig leaves trying to cover themselves. And whereas the fig leaves were a type of atonement, it did not forgive them. So in Genesis 3, 21, the Bible says, God made them coats of skin. That means that God had to kill an animal and take that animal skin to make them clothes sufficient to come into his presence again. That was the first sacrifice. 
sacrifice. And the last sacrifice, a man named Jesus has to come down through 42 generations. Yes, Lord. Take our place on a sinful, ready cross. That was the last sacrifice. Yes, For God Lord. said, no longer will the blood of bullets and goats and rams and kids and be acceptable. There is one name of God who has come. As John was made to say, to take away, not atone for, but to take away the sins of the whole world. I'm so glad that he came. Yes, Lord. I'm glad that he came. After seven days, after they had consecrated the brazen altar, the Bible says, God showed his approval by sending fire down from heaven and lighting the brazen altar for the first time. You gotta see this. God showed his approval by sending his fire. God was saying to the people, everything is done the way I want. And to show you that I'm pleased, let me light it for the first time. But after it has been lit, it's up to you to keep it burning. Y'all missed that. Amen. He said to us in essence, I will light it the first time. Yeah. But after I have lit it, yeah. I expect you to become keepers of the flame. Amen. In other words, I want you to make sure that you don't never let the light go out. And you gotta understand this. Yeah. They used the tabernacle for 647 years. And a year last year they used it. They were still using the same box. That God has sent years ago. How? Because even when they were moving, they would get the embers. And as they traveled, they would fan the embers to make sure that the flame didn't go out. You see, the problem in the house of God is we have allowed our light to go out. Amen. And now we're using anything and anybody to try to get us lit again. But the problem is, if you're going to serve in God's house, you must use God's power. Don't let the light go out. Don't let the light go out. Say, neighbor, 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 don't let the light go out. Neighbor, don't let the light go out. In Leviticus chapter 6, um, chapter 6, verse 12, 13, the scripture says, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings that were placed on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It says, it must not go out. And in verse number one, we find this here. And thou shalt make an altar. The word altar means high and lift it up. An altar of acacia or shittim wood. Now when I was reading this, it talked about in more detail what I was studying. Acacia wood. Acacia wood was a, was a very popular wood during that time. And it was a very durable wood. But the thing that really blessed me about acacia wood is that I, I discovered that if you break the bark on an acacia tree, that tree would begin to bleed a type of resin. And that resin will be used for medicinal purposes. God was letting us know that down the road, yeah. there's, there's coming another person yeah. whose bark is going to be broken. Yeah. But the breaking of his bark, Isaiah said, it is by his right. Right. that we shall be healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everything in the tabernacle was in symbol and in type. God had a message. God had a purpose for everything that he did. Nothing was done by happenstance. Nothing just happened. God wanted to teach us by way of an object lesson how to approach him. The scripture says, wood. Wood, we know, means it's the symbolic of man. But acacia wood here, here at the brazen altar is symbolic of the humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, notice what it says about this wood. This wood must be encased in brass, overlaid in brass. Brass is 
symbolic of judgment. Years ago, scientists discovered that if you take a, 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 a piece of wood and completely encase it in some alloy type of metal, then brass, because all brass is is a combination of copper and tin. But if you completely encase that wood in brass, that wood became fireproof. Don't miss this. It was symbolic of the fact that Jesus Christ in his humanity, being overlaid with judgment, would become fireproof. Thank you, Lord. And the good thing about that is, it's because he became fireproof. We can become fireproof. It lets me know that the same way the wood on the brazen altar was encased in brass for the judgment of people, Jesus Christ on the cross became our judgment because God judged him. The, the Romans didn't judge him. Caiaphas didn't judge him. But God judged him and found him faithful. God judged him. Amen. As he hung there, suspended between the heavens and the earth, bearing your sin, bearing my sin. But the finally he said, it is finished. Yeah. It is fine. Whatever the priest did, no longer apply. It is finished. Whatever they tried to do, it is finished. Whatever they meant to do, it is finished. But now a price has been paid once and for all. Make it five cubits long, five cubits broad, four square. That means it was to be seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, four and a half feet tall. A perfect cube. The height of it shall be three cubits, meaning four and a half feet. The brazen altar symbolized the need for atonement, for reconciliation with God. As the believer entered the courtyard, you know, the outer court, the, again, the first thing he saw was the brazen altar. How many of us came to church this morning ready to confess our sin? Or how many of us came ready to lift your hands and pray to God, ready to get into service, ready to receive the word? But how many came this morning ready to lay something on the altar? God says to us this morning, until you have laid something on the altar, don't bother coming to me. Because when you walked in this morning, I know some of you are hurting. I know you're depressed. I know you're angry. But you got to lay it on the altar if you want to come yeah. any closer to me. And the problem is, we don't want to give up nothing. Yeah, yeah. But God is saying by way of the breaking altar, if you really want to come to me, you got to be willing to give up something. Lay it on the altar. And you know what I found out? I found out that when people brought an animal to be sacrificed, I used to think a long time ago that the priest had the responsibility of killing it. But not so. The person who brought it, he would bring it to the priest, the priest would inspect it to make sure that it met all the requirements the Bible said, and he would move to the north side of the bridge altar. The priest would lay his hands on it, give it back to the person who brought it. He would take it to the brazen altar, present it to another priest, and, and present it to that priest. The offerer would then lay his hands on the head of that sacrifice. And he would take it himself and lay it on the sacrifice. And then the priest would tie it down. And then the priest would hand the offerer a knife. And the offerer had to slit the throat. In doing so, he was saying, God, I know that you said the soul that sinner shall die. But I offer, based on your word, this animal in my place. The priest didn't kill it, I did. And until you are willing to lay something on the altar yourself and not have nobody do it for you. You see, we have the idea, as, 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 as long as the priest is okay, we are all okay. No, 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 no. It's a personal thing. And you got to come to God for yourself, lay it on the altar for yourself, and whatever it is, kill it for yourself. But so nobody wants to. Nobody wants to do that. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. What have you killed lately? What have you killed lately? <laughs> the 
This was the only prescribed way of coming into the presence of God. And the Apostle Paul understood this because he said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. It simply means that we cannot move into God's presence without the atonement for sin. This simply means that when it comes to atonement, it requires a life for a life. The word atonement simply means at one with. So when the animal died, you became one with that animal. So when that animal died again, God saw it as being you dying and not the animal. I want to talk about three things before I sit down. Three elements concerning the great and awful. And each thing points to the cross. First thing, I want to talk about the sacrifice service. The person bringing the altar. The Israelite on the outside who was a sinner was forever shut out from the presence of God. Do you realize that that were, that were Israelites who never saw the Ark of the Covenant? That were Israelites, although camped around it, never was able to visualize the mercy seat. Because with that sin, God would not allow it. Now you would think that being in that close proximity to Almighty God, they could sneak a peek. But they understood the sneak a peek meant instant death. So they kept that distance. And that was the problem. Sin will cause you, sin will make you keep your distance. Have to prove yourself. When we, make, when we mess up and make a mistake, what do we do? We stay home. Instead of coming and saying, God forgive me, we stay home. Uh, I, 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 I'm not ready. I, I know I'm not right with God. But guess what? Staying home don't make you right with God. Amen. Amen. It don't make you right with yourself. Because guilt lets you know, until I get right with God, nothing is going to matter. Until I come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, nothing is going to matter. And that's the usual word from color purple. Until you do right by me. God says, nothing that you do is going to prosper. So why do we try to get around God when God has given us a prescribed way? Why do we try to overstep God or overbound God when God says, no, if you want to come to me, I will receive you, but you've got to come right. The Israelites are going no further than the north side of the bridge of and when he gave that animal, God received that. And he could leave that place with his sins not forgiven, but atoned for. That's the closest they could get to God, having their sin <coughs> covered. Can you imagine being in that close proximity to the Almighty? and not being able to behold his glory for yourself. Can you imagine being that close to your healer, your deliverer, your savior, and not being able to gaze upon him? For the, if they were sentenced to that type of lifestyle, but something happened on Calvary yes, yes. that would ever change that situation. Amen. I don't have to now try to get close to God. Come on, come on. Because now he lives in me. Yes, yes. I don't want to come to church just to meet with God. Because wherever I am, He is. Thank you, Lord. Y'all miss it. Yeah, yeah. We have got an idea that unless I come to church, I can't hear from God. Well, you ain't serving the right God. Amen. Because the scripture that I serve, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means wherever you go, you carry him with you. Now, you don't come to church on Sunday morning just, just to have praise and worship. But you can do that at home. Amen. You don't come to church just to hear the choir sing. You can turn the radio and hear the choir sing. Yeah. So, Pastor, why do we come on Sunday morning? We come to get our marching orders. Because God knows that we got a bad week coming upon us. God knows the devil is mad at us. God knows because we took his place, he's upset at us. And God is coming out to let us know on Sunday how to deal with meaningful money. Amen. Anybody got to work tomorrow? Yeah. Anybody just in love with their boss? 
Anybody got a boss in love with them? <laughs> but you got to drive, you got to go. Yeah. So despite how you feel about your boss, despite how your boss feels about you, some kind of way, you get up and go anyway. Yes, yes. Am I wrong? Right. Right. Amen, you're right. I can't tell you how many days I've gotten up to go to work and didn't feel like going to work. Amen. Didn't want to go to work that day for some reason. Amen. But because I had gotten accustomed to lights being on. Yes, yes. Because I had gotten accustomed to being able to, to, to turn the switch and the lights come on, I went to work. Yes. Because I know that if I don't do what I'm supposed to do over here, I force stuff on the other side. Understand, when you come into the presence of God, it is your way of saying, God, everything that I am and that I am not, I give it to you. Amen. And whatever you see in me, so please, oh God, I'm asking you, I give you permission to remove it. Help me to lay it on the altar. Yes, Lord. That it will allow me to go a little bit closer to you. Because you don't understand, until you've been to the altar, Nothing you do anywhere else is going to be accepted by God. Amen. You, you may be one of the best singers in the house, but guess what? Singers, until you go by the altar first and lay down something, all your singing right. is in vain. Yeah. Preacher, you may have studied for three weeks on one message, yeah. but if you don't stop by the altar first and lay something on there, all your preaching will not make it beyond the ceiling. Right. But when you come to the house on Sunday morning, and you're saying, my purpose, my objective is to get to God's presence. That means that before I go any further, I got a habit that I know don't please God. Yeah. I got a lay on the altar. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This week I got mad at so and so. I really had no reason to for God. Help me lay my attitude on the altar. Yeah. My tongue on the altar. Because that chair don't make me who I am. 
I can sit in the back of the church and still be preacher. I can sit in the back of the church and still be pastor. Where I sit in the house don't determine who I am in the house. When I come to church on Sunday, I don't come to see what you got. Amen. I come to see my Savior. I come to hear from my God. Yes. We used to sing this song in church that said, I'm going to make it to that city if it costs me my life. Yes. When you can get that kind of boldness, when you can get that kind of zeal, that you are purpose in your heart, that you come to hear from God and nobody else. That means you're willing to lay something on the altar. I can't tell you how many times I've come into the house of God and I sat right there. And before I step up here, Lord, whatever you see in me that will keep me from hearing from you, please take it up. Because when I stand in this spot, I do understand that when I stand here, it is the same as God standing here. And so if God was standing here, what would God say to his people? And I know that if I'm walking in sin, living in sin, lusting in sin, God can't speak to me. God can't speak to me. I have purpose in my heart. And when I stand, I make sure that I've gone by the prison and I've laid something that was displeasing to God there. That when God sees me, He sees my sacrifice. That when God sees me, he knows it's not all about me. Yeah. But I'm willing to lay down whatever this feeds him. Yeah. Get rid of whatever he don't like. Because yeah. the sacrifice understands that it is not about him. What have you laid your hands on the head of and said, no, take this away from me. That was the sacrifice. Sorry, let's look at the sacrifice itself. You could bring goats, bulls, rams. But pastor, those, those, those were animals and, and everybody didn't, couldn't, couldn't afford those. God said, I understand. Those who can't afford it, bring me a pigeon, bring me a turtle dove. Everybody could afford something if you really want to see God. Amen. Everybody got something that they can lay on the altar if they really want to see God. So the excuse, I don't have what they have, won't wash with God. God says, whatever you got that don't please me, bring that and yes. it'll be yes. Well, well, Pastor, I don't have to, I'm, I'm, I'm not a bigger sinner as so and so. You know, they be out there, they be hanging out, but, you know, I don't hang out no more. I, I hang out okay. Okay, bring me the occasional hangout. Come on now, come on now. Because I'm teaching the saints, I don't hang out at all. You're not ready to proceed beyond the bridge and all. But when you can say, God, everything that I know in me that don't please you, God, help me to lay it and leave it. I said, lay it and leave it. I didn't say lay it and then cleave it. Because I, I've heard folks say, yeah, I can't. I confess. But I'm grown. And ain't no priest going to tell me how I ought to live. And then I would say, you're absolutely right. You are grown. That's right. And the preacher has no right to tell you how to live. But when the preacher is standing in God's place, Amen. and the words that he's speaking don't belong to the preacher, but they belong to God. Yeah. And for you to say, you don't tell me, this way, I don't get offended. I, right. I don't get hurt. Yeah, I used to. But I've come to understand that when I'm telling you what God said the Lord, and you got a problem with me? I understand. Your problem is not really with me. Because I'm just a messenger boy. I'm just the one who brought the word. If you got a problem with what I say, then take it to the one who said it. At the bridge and altar. As I see a transfer of sin. It allows you to come before God sinful, wretched, mean and nasty. And once the, the offering has been approved by the priest, and you laid your hands on it, and then you killed it, you could leave that with a renewed disposition.
and thanking God. Because God, at least for a little while now, you don't see my sin. And as good as that was, that still is sufficient. Because what it did temporarily, it changed your standing before God. But it did not change your position with God. You were simply atoned. For that Calvary. When Jesus, the Lamb of God, that perfect one and for all sacrifice, hung his head and died, and I received him, thus I identify with him. Now when God sees you, he don't see a sinner whose sins have been atoned for. He sees a sinner whose sins have been forgiven. And that makes all the difference. In the world. As I said earlier, there was nothing pretty about the grace of It was a place where an innocent animal was sacrificed. It was a bloody place. The priests didn't even wear shoes. They had to walk through the blood as they served. Don't miss this church. They were not dressed in the fines of a parrot. They wore all white to symbolize their purity before God. And when you walk through the blood mm. of the sacrifice wounds that God had received, how many want to go through the blood this morning? Yeah, yeah. You got to be willing to wade through the blood. You got to be willing to wade, walk through the blood. There was nothing photogenic about this place. It was the body and the blood of slain animals was accumulated. And it was being done. Look at the sacrifice. The scripture says in verse number two, and thou shalt make the horns. Horns symbolize power of it. The, on the corner. On every corner of the altar, there was a horn. Again, the horns symbolized power. And initially, it symbolized the power of the animal that was laying on the, on the sacrifice. But ultimately, it will represent the fact that our Lamb of God. Now, Notice something about this. In Old Testament time, that sacrifice had to be tied down. That means that it was laid down there unwillingly. It had to be strapped down, bound down to the altar. But on Calvary, the Lamb of God, he went willingly. He went voluntarily. Yeah, but Pastor, they nailed his hands. They never speak. That was just not, not to keep them there because that was just a method of execution. You know what kept them there? It was not the nails. It was his love for you. Amen. His love for me. Yeah. His love for God that kept him on the cross. Because yeah. remember what he said? Peter, don't put the sword away. Don't you understand by now that if I just spoke to my father, he sent me a legion of angels to fight for me? Yeah. But Peter, I didn't come to fight. This time. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Don't miss for this time. Yeah. Because he is coming back. Yeah. Riding on a white horse. Yeah. And the good thing is, yeah. I'm going to be part of that camp. Yeah. 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 So Peter, right now, put it away. Yeah. You don't need it right now. Hallelujah. This is the wrong arena for that time. But Peter, <laughs> put it away. Put it away. Put it away. But see, at Calvary, he died. That we might have life. Yeah. At Calvary, yeah. he took our place. Yeah. That we might inherit his place. Yeah. On Calvary, he took our hell. Yeah. That we could gain his heaven. On Calvary, yeah. he bore the scars of the cross. Yeah. That we could present, he presented spotless before the Father. Amen. The altar, he cast a shadow upon the cross. Where the altar was attacked, the cross was the reality. It would be the place where God himself became both the offerer and the offering. His horns shall be the same, and thou shalt overlay it with bread. Again, four horns on a brazen altar symbolizing strength, salvation, and power. Now, when I was reading this, some, something came to mind. I, I read where if a person accidentally Accidentally kill somebody. Mm -hmm. 
and they fled to the city of refuge. Their life could be spared. And when they got to the city of refuge, they were to go and grab hold of the horn of the ark. That means that I have found sanctuary in the presence of God. In the Bible, I see where it says in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 50 and 53, Adonai was caught in his sin. Caught in his sin. And he fled to the horns of the altar seeking refuge. And Solomon showed him mercy. Solomon showed him mercy and gave him a chance to prove himself. But another man named Joab, he fled to the same altar, grabbed the same horn, and the Bible says he received no mercy. Now, how is it possible that what was mercy for somebody was no mercy for somebody else? Very easy. Everyone that come to church don't really come to church. Just because somebody come to church and, and sit down don't mean don't mean they're listening to what's going on. So what served to be a blessing to some can become a curse to others. Do you understand that the preaching of the cross is, is a blessing to us? But for those who don't believe it, it's a curse. Because what they did with what they saw was rejected. Whereas those of us who believed it, we got blessed by it. So when you come to church, you got to go by the brain and all. Because the same altar that will bless you and allow your sin to be atoned for, that same altar, if you try to go by it, will become your detriment and it will curse you and you will die. Amen. Church, you cannot proceed to God without doing what God wants us to do. Amen. And for too long, we have haphazardly rushed the church, rushed through service, so we can get out and see what the football game. How many folks sitting in this morning worry about the Dolphin game? I'm worried about that. I ain't going to worry. No, if, if you're a Dolphin fan, you worry about it. Because they're not, having, they're not having a good season this year. And so you're, you're, you're worrying with, with reason. But how about it if you, when you come to church, you leave all sporting events at home. You leave issues at work at home. You leave family problems at home. Because I'm going now to get before my God. Yeah. And if I get before my God, I know that my God has the power to change that situation by the time I get back home. So I'm going to come to the house of God and I'm going to call on you. Hoping, trusting, believing that whatever I'm told with this morning, he has the authority, he has the power to make it right. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Don't bring all that, all that foolishness. Because you, you sit there and, and you want to, come on, Pastor, you can't do it. Kick off in 30 minutes. Don't let that kick off be a cause of your demise. Because you know something? There are those people that, that, that will give all they have to be able to sit where you are sitting this morning. But they don't have the opportunity. So while you are here, please don't squander the opportunity. You are not here because you deserve to be here. Because you are so good, but because God has given you another chance to get right where you've been wrong. And you ought to say, God, I thank you for it. Take every advantage of God, whatever it is you don't like. Now, I understand that's not easy to say. Yeah. 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 Because you got to confess, God, I don't have it all together. I understand that. I understand that we are prideful people, and we got to pretend like we got it all together. But there will come a time in your life. When you got to get real with yourself. Yes. And you got to tell God, God, I'm a wretch under. I can't handle this. I need to go. And God, until you do it, I know it won't get done. God, if you don't do this, I, I try. So God, until you take this and deal with it, nothing is going to be done. And when you get serious about God, he 
he's already serious about you. Because he sent his son to you. He's already proved how much he loves you. And if you show him how much you love him, by laying aside your pride, The best is here. The best is here. I know the verse about three, and I'm going to move real, real quickly. It is five things that the priest were to use in ministering at the breaking off. We see his pans, his shovels, his basins, his flesh hooks, his fire pans. The purpose of these vessels was to help them minister at the brazen altar. Well, God has given us a five-fold blessing. And the purpose is not for us to get beside ourselves. The purpose of the five-fold blessing, or the five-fold ministry, as we call it, is to bring the church to the fullness of Christ Jesus. God didn't give you a ministry of prophecy when you go to free market and start your own business. Every gift God gave you, he didn't give it to you. He gave it to his body. He wanted to use you as a channel of his blessings. But it's not about you. It's never been about you. It's always been about God. And if God gives you something to use and you don't use it, you're going to wish you had. Amen. I get aside. I, I, I get so upset with folks that God begins to use in special mighty way and they get a case of the big head. Oh, now, all of a sudden, you need bodyguards. Who want to kill you? Jesus, come on now. All of a sudden, now, you, you, you improve of how important you were. My because before you was in the church, nobody knew who you were. That's right. Come on. And you was out there trying to find someone to preach. But because God blessed you and opened some doors for you, now, unless you got a posse to travel with you. I got so disturbed to you. I watched I watch this program. I, I wouldn't even dignify by calling this thing. The question was asked, well, what if we get invited to go to a church that can't afford your honorary? That's right. Ooh, he said, well, I guess that means that God didn't intend me to go there. What? what? Yeah. Even because they can't pay you enough money, you can't go there and preach? What I said to God. Come on now. That's right. Church, what has happened to us? We have gotten that same mentality that's circulating in the world. Right. We have become just like the world. Right. And the reason is because too many of us who claim to be what we're not have not gone by the brazen altar. Because if you go by the brazen altar, you'll leave all that mess behind. Yes. Exactly. And thou shalt make a break of necklace of glass. Picture, if you will, a big barbecue pit. The breaking off was two parts. It was two parts to it. It was a big hollow thing with a big hole in the middle and a brass, a, a, a brass grate that sat in the middle of it. But the Bible says it was made of wood, or case of wood, then covered with brass. Everywhere you see the breaking off, you see brass. The only place you see brass is in the outer court. The only way you see judgment is in the outer court. That lets us know that before you get any further with God, you have to be judged first. Yes. If you're trying to get into God's presence without being judged, it will never work. Amen. Somebody say the brazen off. Say, neighbor, neighbor. have you been, been judged? Go down to verse number six. Let's pray for the church of God. I know some of you guys didn't know where to go. And thou shall make saints. Poems. Symbolic of pilgrimage. Symbolic of wonder. Symbolic of their wandering and journeying through the desert. And thou shalt make stays for the altar. Stays of acacia wood. And then, this is what it says, overlay them in brass. I like that. Because you see, when they were journeying from one place to another, the only part of the actual furniture that anybody could touch was the stage. They would pick up the stage, and they would carry the stage, and the furniture would hang suspended between the heaven and the earth. And in grasping that brazen stage, it was saying, God, I thank you. 
that I've been judged. I think that you have looked upon me and judged me worthy to get this close to you. Have you, have, have you ever been close to a celebrity? Anybody in here ever been close to a celebrity? Did you walk away feeling kind of special? I have a picture on my wall of me shaking hands with President Bush. <laughs> President Bush. I took a picture with President Bush. It doesn't matter which one. <laughs> President Bush. I've seen Bill Clinton. I've been as close to the Pope as me, not the one now, but me and me and Brother Pence. I've been that close to the Pope. I've been close to the Pope. <laughs> I've been close to Clinton. I've been close to Bush. So because I've been close to them, does that mean they know me? No, no. no. If I call up Clinton, hey, it's Bill. <laughs> hey, Bill, it's Bill. <laughs> Bill who? And if I stay on the phone too long, and he starts asking me a lot of questions, see what he's doing, he's tracing the call. And if I stay on the phone too long, <laughs> so because I've been close to them, don't mean I've been close to them. Amen. Same way because you've been to church and you've been close to a move of God. You've seen God bless folk. You've seen God save folk. Because you've been in close proximity. You see, you don't get saved by proximity. If you're going to get saved, it's not because you got close to God. It's because Jesus moved on the inside of you and took up residency. Yeah. You don't get saved because of who somebody else knows. Yeah. Come on now. It's because one day you bowed to me and said, God, forgive me. Jesus. God, I've taken inventory and I know that the way I'm living is not pleasing yeah. to you. Come on now. So God, I give everything yeah. that I have. I get so disturbed when people say, well, when I was in the world, I had this. When I was in the world, I drove this car. I wore these clothes. I lived here. Yeah, but you were going to hell. My God, you better say that. I mean, don't that mean anything? Yes, everything. Come on now. That means that so what if I gave up designer clothes? I got a new home now. I got a new destination now. I got a new focus now. And yeah, I can walk away from stuff, but in the final analysis, I didn't give up nothing that God didn't give me back. Yeah. Yeah. Come on now. Hallelujah. And he gave it back. Jesus. He gave it back. Hallelujah. He gave it back. Jesus. Glory. And the final verse it says, Hollow with boys shall you miss. As it was shown me in the mouth. In other words, make it according to the specifications that I gave you. So shall you me. I have a, a good friend of mine that, that's, a, that's a contact. And he, he has this principle <laughs> that is called the 10% principle. <laughs> that means that when you're ordering supplies, he's being honest. Order at least 10% more than you're going to need. Because I can assure you, I'm going to waste at least 10%. <laughs> I'm going to mess up at least <laughs> but God said, use the dimensions that I give you. If I said make it five days, make it five days. If I said a quarter of an inch, make it a quarter of an inch. Because you see, what I'm giving you is a pattern Amen. of what's already up here. Amen. And you see, the way they serve me up here, that's how I'm going to be served down there. So if you want to get what they got up here, uh -huh. you got to do what I tell you down there. Yeah. See, you got to understand, church, there's a concept that says the heavens do rule. Right. If you're going to win any battles down here, you got to first win them up there. Because that's where the real battle takes place. And one of the biggest battles you will ever meet is when you come to church and you hear a word and the devil try to say, well, no. He's talking to somebody. Else. He's talking to me. And you know in your in your own spirit. Yeah, God is reading my mail this morning. He knows he's talking about me. But because of what somebody around you may think, what they may think, what they may say, 
You say, well, I'm not going to come because if I come, I know what he's saying is true. I know I believe. I know that's the actual. But if I go out there, folk may look at me strange. Who cares? Amen. Who cares? I mean, who really cares? Do you really want to stand before God one day and say, God, I heard the word, and I know you were speaking to me through your spirit. But God, I, I also knew that if I moved when I was functioned by the spirit, they would talk about me. And do you really want to hear God say, do, do you really want to tell God? God, I was more concerned with what folk may say about me than what you had said to me. You got to wait. You got to wait. So in closing this morning, in the breaking off, we learn several things. That a substitutionary sacrifice is necessary for the forgiveness of sin. Amen. At the breaking off, of something had to die in the place of man for man's sin to be atoned for. There is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. There is no way to approach God to be saved other than through the death of a substitute. And whereas in the Old Testament that came by way of animal, and the New Testament came by way of Jesus Christ. At the grace of we see a demonstration of the holiness of God. We see God saying, I love you so much, but I love you too much to let you come to me in the present state that you're in. Now, I've made provisions for you to come to me. All you got to do is avail yourself of me. I've made provisions for you to come to me and get close to me, to love me, to be a part of me. You got to calm the way that I have so prescribed. And again, final word, no other part of worship, no other part of worship will be accepted, will be accepted unless we come by way of the great nation. Remember, church, today's ashes were yesterday's sacrifice. Meaning that we are here today because somebody laid something on the altar Amen. yesterday. What have you laid on the altar that can become your ashes tomorrow? That can also be used to further your walk with God. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen.